part of it. I will get home. What a powerful trailer for a powerful story that's loosely based on the true story of one of our guests today, Isaac Wright Jr., who was in prison for a crime that he did not commit. How many of us tuned in right now can relate to that? While incarcerated, he became a licensed attorney and helped overturn these wrongful convictions of 20 of his fellow inmates before finally proving his own innocence. This doesn't even seem real when you hear this story. Uh, coming out of my mouth, but it seems totally real growing up in America and disenfranchised communities where people don't have access to the resources and the judicial system doesn't seem to work for us at all. So, Heather B., when you hear about somebody who learns how to do law um, in prison, you know, I know friends who went to different law schools. I wanted to go to Hastings uh, when I was a youth, study political science and go to Hastings. It was too confusing. It was too perplexing for me. So I took the route of hip hop and uh, <laughs> <laughs> screw this, <laughs> you, know, shit. you know, because the jargon, the language is written in a way that is not really you can't just gra- you just don't understand it without yeah. help. Well, it's interesting because we had Wallow here recently with Wallow and Gilly and Wallow said while he was in prison, instead of being in the yard and having these conversations that he felt like he kept having on the streets, he ended up befriending an attorney in prison and started listening to conversation and that inevitably taught him how to become trademark and own his property and doing an uh, intellectual attorney, a property attorney. So mm. it's amazing, Sway, what you said about the language and how people can learn within the system. It's even more amazing um, now that uh, this man is a practicing attorney after being vetted for nine years by the Bar Association, they finally mm-hmm. opened those doors of, and let him do what he was already doing. Um, he's here with us today. He's with another very powerful actor um, that I've been a big fan of. DB, you want to do the honors, man? Well, he's had an interesting life. I mean, you know, he's uh, considered an English actor, but he did spend a significant amount of time in Saudi Arabia, from what I understand, when he was young. And then he's also a part of the Marvel franchise because he was in Captain America, the first Avenger. He played a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, which is a pretty cool title to have if you're going to be a part of the Marvel Universe. Uh, He's also on Netflix right now in Criminal UK. I mean, the guy is getting that TV money, as we like to say. You know what I mean? And now he's on ABC uh, portraying uh, the other gentleman that we have with us as well. Okay, we have Isaac Wright Jr with us and Nicholas Pinnock is with us as well. Welcome to Sway in the Morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, man. Glad to be here. Really happy to be here. Yeah, man. Um, glad to have you. It's kind of hard to unravel all of, all of this, but let's start with you, Isaac. Um, first of all, I, I'm, I'm using you as, a, as an example. I was telling you this off mic that I got some friends that are representing themselves in the court of law. Um, I, I've never been convicted of a crime. Um, but I have been in a court of law for other reasons. Um, and it's just not the easiest thing to do. Can you tell us your story, man? How, how what, 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 can you tell us how you got to this point? Well, <laughs> obviously, um, a, a big, a big, I guess, force, a big uh, deciding factor for me was the situation that I found myself in. I mean, I, I didn't know anything about the law. I never picked up a law book. Uh, until I find myself behind bars facing the rest of my life in prison. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, beyond facing the rest of my life in prison, you know, I had um, uh, interviewed a number of attorneys who, was, who were telling me that the, the best they can do for me was, you know, me spending 15, 20 years in prison on a plea agreement. Um, and, uh, you know, the more I was saying that, you know, that, that these things weren't true, that the allegation against me, wasn't true that I was I was not uh, a drug kingpin the more they were convinced that I was and so you know I was I was forced in a situation where I had to decide whether I wanted to allow someone to represent me and pay them to send me to prison for a very long time or you know I could put the gloves on and strap up my boots and you know, and, and go it alone. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I decided that it was it was better for me um, if I was going to go to prison and it was clear to me based on what was going on and the things that they were doing and that I saw them doing for the, you know, for the very first time, it was very, 
very, very uh, a, a big, a huge awakening in the sense that I didn't understand th- what the system was mm-hmm. until I got into it and and how rotten um, uh, it it was uh, to, to certain people until I was in it. And so for me, uh, I felt solace and I felt comfort and and whatever my destiny was going to be, as long as it was a destiny that I had control over. Mm-hmm. And so I picked up a law book for the first time. And, you know, when I read the first line, it was like I was doing it all my life. Mm-hmm. And so I realized then that I had a gift. Um, and looking back at that situation from where I'm at, where I'm at right now, um, I saw that it was a divine journey mm-hmm. and that these things that I was, I was going through and that I was going to go through, um, it was, you know, it was, it was, um, it was directed by something much more powerful and much more divine, uh, obviously than, than me or, or any man. And, and, and that's, you know, that, that was the beginning of my journey. And obviously I'm here now and I'm an attorney and, um, um, I'm continuing to fight, mm-hmm. and I've become a part of the system that victimized me, uh, but I'm a better part. Um, I'm that part that does the right thing, yeah. that protects the rights of other people, um, and that makes sure and that makes sure uh, that whenever uh, there's a challenge, a, a, a challenge, and whenever there's injustice in, in front of me, that that I'm, I make room to move past it and and, and to represent the people uh, in that manner. Uh, couple of things you say once you got inside that courtroom and realized and start having a better understanding of what the system is what is that understanding how would you summarize it well you know I I, I had a question uh, in, a, in, a, in LA at the premiere uh, that was similar along those lines and there was something that I had to really clarify about the system okay and I think it's I think this is a great opportunity to do that now so that so that the people listening can can really understand what what the system is about and and the reason why you know sometimes the right thing happens but you know many times it it does not the system especially in the United States I, I believe that the US this country has the greatest system in the world and and I'm saying this as a victim of that same system I don't think there is any system anywhere in the world that's better than the United States system mm-hmm. of justice uh, it is the people that runs this system that corrupts it. You know, if, if you look at if you look at our Constitution, uh, there's two layers of protection that we have in this country. We have a United States Constitution that protects individuals, and each state has a Constitution that protects their citizen. So the system is set up in a way to be the most beautiful, righteous thing that you can ever imagine. Um, that kind of a system takes special people to run it. And if you do not have the character, if you do not have the morality, integrity, the honor, uh, and the honesty to run a system like this, all you're going to do is bring havoc to it. You're going to, you're going to operate the system in ways that perpetuates who you are. Um, you know, if you're a racist, you're going to lock up minorities. Uh-huh. You know, if you, if you have a, have a, a, a hatred, for certain people or hatred for yourself or you're unbalanced, uh, the system is going to reflect who you are. Uh-huh. And so, you know, that is that is the reason why um, we have a lot of these problems in the system because we have some of the wrong people running it. Would you say that some of those wrong people included the judge that presided over your trial, your original trial? Well, he went to jail. He went uh, to jail. Yeah, so so that, that speaks for it. That speaks uh-huh. volumes. You know, uh-huh. he, went, he went to prison himself. Uh, he was removed from the bench, lost his pension, you know, and it's 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 a tragedy because you have a man that's in his seventies that 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 dedicated, you know, most of his life to public service, uh-huh. and and he chose to do the wrong thing. He in the twilight of his years, you know, he ruined his legacy uh-huh. uh, because because he was sitting in a position where he did not belong because he refused to adjust himself. Uh, to what that position demanded uh-huh, of him, uh-huh. um, and and you know that that's important because you know people even when you're not 100% inside 
and you take on a position, you need to adjust yourself for that position, whether you're a judge, a prosecutor, a police officer. If you adjust yourself to the honor of the position that you're taking, you know, a lot of these things uh, uh, that we're screaming in the streets about right now, a lot of the injustices that has been occurring and that, and that is occurring would not happen. So it's about the people running the system. Indeed. But the system can work for disenfranchised folks if the right people are in place functioning from an honest lens. The people that came here and created this country yeah. were disenfranchised. Okay. They, they, they set up this system specifically for the disenfranchised. Mm-hmm. And so, and so um, they understood uh, that this is the system uh, that a government needs if the disenfranchised is going to have any hope. Uh-huh. You know, but but when you turn it into the king's place, you know, for lack of a better word, uh-huh. uh, uh, in the medieval period, you know, it was the king's place. It was it was what the king said. If you if you wanted a fair trial, you only got one. If the king demanded, you get a fair trial. Um, if you wanted a fair trial, you only got one. You know, if the dukes and the lords uh, uh, demanded that you got a fair trial, the common people had no power at all. And, and what the the founders of this country did was put the power in the common man. Uh-huh. And so and so when people now come into power and into, in positions of power in this country, when you see injustices occurring, it is because they don't want to share that power with the common man. They want to incorporate it into themselves and they want to dictate what happens to, uh, to one person from one person to another without allocating that power and the say to the common man. And that's what juries are about. And sometimes, mm-hmm. a lot of times, uh, um, uh, they're, they're, how should I say, um, overlooked in the sense that uh, they control what goes before a jury, mm-hmm. it, whether it be the prosecutor creating his own narrative at the time of the arrest or you know, not, not providing evidence of a person's innocence. It's, it's a lot of things that goes on be- with people that are in power and who who do not want to share that power with the common man so that justice can prevail. Isaac Reich Jr. is here. Nicholas Pinnock is here as well, who um, plays him in a new series for life, premiering Tuesday, February 11th on ABC. Nicholas, I haven't forgotten you, man. I, you know, I just find this story, obviously you found it extremely interesting and uh, for you to even take on this role. What was it about the role that, that made you jump up to it? There was something about the... Um, the uh, <clears throat> Just the story of the man that was portrayed in this um, in this world, where you have um, the prison life, you got the legal life, and you got the family life, and all these things fighting against each other. Um, for an actor, for me, it was a dream. Just looking at all the different levels that I could go to to play this one person who has to code switch mm-hmm. completely. He has to be one person with the warden. Has to be another person with the prisoners. He has to be another person with, um, when he's in front of a judge, another person with his family. Um, and after speaking to to Isaac the first time, there was a lot of those elements that we spoke about. Yeah, he had to, uh, you know, morph and be different aspects of himself. So for me, it was um, it was a no brainer, really. Yeah, to to want to jump in and explore this world. It frightened me. Mm-hmm. Um, because every every job I do, I want it to be more challenging than the last one. Um, can I do this? Mm-hmm. And I didn't think I could. Mm. Oh, shit, you didn't think you could? No. <laughs> After you signed on, you still wasn't sure? Oh, no. I'm still not sure. You're still not sure? No. I just went and did the best job that I could do every yeah. day when I, got, when I went to work. Uh-huh. And, you know, on February the 11th, we'll find out if the public think it worked or not. Well, I think it did. You think it did, Isaac? Abs- well, absolutely. Well, that, that, that's the most important, absolutely. you know, uh, opinion. opinion you want to have. 50 Cent uh, came on board with this project. What was that like meeting him? What what happened that first day? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, 50 is 50 is a man in, in of himself. Um, very, very uh, powerful uh, businessman. Very influential businessman. Uh, he was a made man when I met him. Uh-huh. Uh, but obviously... He wasn't somebody that I knew, and so, you know, based on all my experience in life, uh, it, it, you know, I, I do, I do incorporate what I've learned about a person, um, but I have to size you up. Yeah, you know, when I meet a person for the first time, uh, j- just, just as a matter of course, you will get sized up, uh-huh. uh, and being, 
in the environment that I had to live in for so very, very long, you learn how to do that very quickly. 0.3 seconds, I've sized you up, and I've made a decision. And, and sit, sitting down with 50, listening you know, to, to what he was saying and him listening to me, one of the things that, that caught me is uh, there was a guy that, you know, that actually introduced us. And I, I saw no, nothing was signed. There was no uh, agreements. There was, there was no idea to even pitch yet. It was just something that was presented to him. And I saw 50 say to this guy, he says, listen, we don't, I don't need no contract. You know, come by the office. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you the first, your full year. You know, he, w- he knew that he had something. He knew it so deeply that he was willing to take the risk of paying this guy for a whole year before he even decided to put an idea together to pitch it. And so mm. when I saw him do that, uh, I was like, okay, uh, I can roll the dice and turn my back. I know when I turn around, I'm going to have sevens. Mm-hmm. And sitting here today, I'm, I'm looking at sevens. You're looking at sevens. <laughs> Isaac Wright Jr., I ain't, I ain't mad at that. I, I, you know, there's so many questions and there's so many people on the line I want to get to. Um, congratulations, first and foremost, man. The reading about your story is nothing but an inspiration. I, and, I, you know, I, I know it's a lot of folks behind bars now that realize that their representation wasn't really representing them. That plea bargain mm-hmm. thing has been weaponized against people just to get them in jail. Hey, man, you might not do life, but I'll give you 20. That sounds good. Nah, that don't sound good. People take it because out of fear and they end up spending 20 years that they didn't necessarily have to do in jail. You've helped reverse some sentencing for a, a number of inmates, correct? Yes, yes. Um, what do, what, you know, Nicholas talked about uh, switching code. Like, what was it like for you going from the courtroom back to the jail cell? And, and how did people respond to that? Well, one of the, one of the turning moments for me is, uh, was very early on, um, when I decided I was going to represent myself, um, and and this is something that actually uh, Nicholas incorporated uh, uh, in his work on this show, but I was um, I was doing a motion for the very first time. I did a lot of research and I was working really hard. I just decided I'm you know I'm representing myself, so I'm, I'm really getting into the grind. And I actually fell asleep with the paperwork on my lap. I woke up uh, maybe an hour or two later and decided to get a fresh start. Read what I wrote. We had, what I had written and, you know, kind of finish it up. And when I began to read it as as fresh eye, uh, I didn't even recognize the person who wrote it. Uh-huh. It was so, it was so emotionally distraught that I couldn't even read it. And uh-huh. so I knew no one else was going to read or listen to what I had to say. And so at that time I had to, I had to find a way to, to be a third person, to, to take myself, to detach myself from that emotional baggage that I was holding on to that was taking away my focus and that was not going to allow me to represent myself in a way that was going to be successful. I had to become another person um, and it was only until I figured out how to do that 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 things started getting better and better and better for me and you know it, it takes me back to a conversation Nicola and I, Nicholas and I had and it was a very very impressive and powerful moment for me. He came up to me and he said let me see your hands. And, you know, that was a strange request, but, you know, I, this, this guy is going to be out there doing his thing, you know, in my honor. So I, I just threw my hands out. You know, I put my hands out so he could look at him. And I'm looking at him, you know, because I'm studying him. I'm looking at him while he's looking at my hands. And he says, um, can I get that ring? And the only jewelry that I ever wear is a ring. It was a ring that I got when I first got out of, out of prison. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even ask him why he wanted it, because I knew. I took the ring off, and I, I gave it to him. And I realized then that he didn't want his character to act like me. He wanted his character to be me. Oh. And that was powerful. I really, really appreciated that. And from that moment, I mean, I had a lot of respect from him from day one, but from that moment, he, he didn't know it. But something else happened to me inside where I knew I was going to be all right in the terms of the way that this character was going to be portrayed. And uh, he went above and beyond. I mean, he was 110 uh, percent on this. And, and for the first time, you know, he was one of the one of the very few people that allowed me to 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 kind of be therapeutic in the way this process went, because in watching him 
was like watching myself as a third person, watching my suffering, watching my pain, something that I had never had an opportunity to do before then. Mm. Oh, and make sure y'all watch this uh, for live premiering Tuesday, February 11th on ABC. Um, Isaac Wright Jr. is here. Nicholas Pinnock is here as well. Um, Isaac, we hear this term all the time. Life isn't fair. Things aren't fair. And we've also, I would say in the last maybe five years, we hear about mental health and people dealing with mental health issues. To have a sentence put on you of that magnitude um, for something you did not even do, um, mentally, how did you deal with it? You know, um, just knowing that you didn't do this particular, how did you cope mentally? You know, it was a it was a serious challenge. I mean, you know, some of the things that um, uh, that I utilized inside to to be able to deal with it came from from being a kid. You know, being raised in a certain kind of family. My, mm. my father was in the military for thirty years. He fought in Korea and he fought in Vietnam, um, and he had six children. It was five boys, um, and it was one girl. My 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 sister was. Uh, uh, she was a baby. She was twin to one of my brothers. Um, but coming up as a as a kid, uh, you know, he we were in the military. I mean, I was in boot camp for 18 years. You know, so by the time I I left school, I left high school, and I started trying to go out on my own. I, I had certain types of of I had a different a certain personality, a, a disciplinary personality, and so um, you know, I understood what it meant to fight to the death if you're fighting for something that you believe in. So when, you know, being being faced faced with life in prison and then getting life in prison is two different things because when you're faced with it, there's always that hope. When you actually get it, it turns into something else altogether different. Uh, uh, when, when I was in the courtroom and I was getting sentenced, I remember the prosecutor was standing on, on the side and as a judge was handing down the sentence, I saw him leave his table and it was strange to me. It, it caught my attention because you're supposed to be standing facing the court. He left his table and he went up to the bench, the judge's bench. And when he went to the judge's bench, I looked at him and he turned around with his back to the judge so that he can face me. And as a judge says, life for that first charge that he was giving me life, he looked at me and he started smiling. And so the reason why I, I realized the reason why he went to the judge to turn around is so that he can smile at me as I was getting this sentence. And so when I when I heard life, everything else was a buzz. It was just me standing in the courtroom, uh, and there was a number of other sentences that was handing down, over 70, 70 years and all on the other sentences. And um, the thing that, that kind of woke me up from, from us staring at each other was the gavel. When he finished handing down the sentence, he, he hit the gavel. Um, and, uh, and the prosecutor, you know, he continued to smile, and as he walked away, going to the table to shake hands with some of the people that were sitting behind him uh, after I was sentenced, uh, we still kind of looked at each other while he was smiling. And I smiled, I actually smiled back at him while he was smiling at me. Um, but that moment was a moment where I, I knew that I was buried alive. I mean, th that was it, the dirt was over the grave. Uh, and at that point, I had to find my, I had to find a way, you know, to to dig myself out of it. What was your smile back about? Because when I was smiling back at him, um, what I understood that he didn't know, and, and don't, you know, I don't want to give the wrong impression. Yeah. I was hurting inside. Uh -huh. You know, I was, I was in pain. I was in agony. Um, but I knew early on when I decided uh, that I was going to represent myself that I was going to prison forever. I mean, I knew I was going to get life because I, I saw what they was doing in order to make that happen. And I saw the judge uh, doing things that, that brought me to understand that he was a part of it. So I knew I was finished. And so what I did at that time is that everything that I was doing, even representing myself, trying the case, everything that I was doing was not to keep myself out of prison. It was to keep me, keep them from keeping me there. And so when he was smiling at me, I knew he was living in the moment. When I was smiling at him, I was living in the future. I knew that he had got his satisfaction for that 15 minutes of those sentences. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, I was going to work to get myself out. That, that, wow. wow. That's amazing. I'm going to take a couple of calls. Uh, that same prosecutor uh, went on a run 
right? He fled. This yes. is the same guy that ended up committing suicide. Yes. In a, in, in Vegas, in a in a hotel, uh, because all of these things were uncovered. Um, James Dugan. Uh, succumbed to a charge of official misconduct and attempt to evade prison. This was a police officer that recounted his statements that he made in the original trial. Was correct? No, it was, was, this was this was after um, this was in a post conviction relief hearing. Okay. Um, I had earlier on a few years before that I had created a new law dealing with the kingpin conviction in another prisoner's case, mm-hmm. and I got him released. And then I took that new law. And I got my own kingpin conviction released, uh, uh, re- reversed. And so, but but they understood what I was doing. So they, they they cut me off at the knees by affirming all the other convictions, which means I had, even though the life sentence was gone, I had like 70 years left on the other charges. Yeah. And so by my seven, th- seven and a half year in, I had another hearing um, where I got this police officer to confess on the stand in that hearing is to call a post conviction relief hearing. I had gotten so good by that time, seven and a half years later that I was able to, to force him to confess. And when he did, you know, I sat down, uh, after he broke, he, you know, he, he broke down, he started crying. He said, I was holding this in for seven and a half years. And he just, he told the story. The prosecutor uh, evidently saw it on the news. Uh, he was already in trouble and, now he was going to be in more trouble, so he ran. The feds went after him and caught him in in Vegas. Tried to talk him down as he forced himself in the room. He, you know, he put a gun in his mouth and he killed himself. Uh, Isaac Wright Jr. is here. Uh, Nicholas Pinnock is here as well for live premiering Tuesday, February 11th on ABC. Um, that's unfortunate that police officer felt he had to hold that information for seven years, but I guess that's that code that uh, a lot of folks tend to live by. But let that be an example to other police officers who may be living by that code um, that it, you know, release yourself from that. You know, that's that's not what this system is. So I'm not a police officer. I got family members, and I don't want to get slammed by them. I don't. I'm not really concerned about that. Release yourself. You know what I mean. That that cold doesn't supersede spirituality and, the, and, and right and wrong. Release yourself of that. You know, and to those who are still locked up, read Isaac's story because this is hope. You know, it's a lot of folks that don't feel like they can do that. Like, like who was checking your writing? Like, did you have a? You were your own tutor. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Everything was me. The system is set up. Yeah. To separate yourself from help. I mean, it's it's not. Anybody that 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 uh, family member has been in jail, they, they'll they'll tell you the same thing. The only thing that they can do, bring some food packages, go on a visit, and scrape up some money uh, to try to pay a lawyer. And a lot of people they lose everything mm-hmm. t- doing that. You know, they lose their homes, they lose everything trying to help, you know, help a family member out. Uh, the system the system is set up like that, and so when you're alone, you're really alone there. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's all about you, and in, and even when you're you know, when you're into hiring attorneys, it you know, your destiny depends on the attorney that you hire. Some people are better off, and you know, I don't, I don't like want to give public defenders a bad name, but some people are better off with public defenders. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it makes no sense for your family to lose everything for you to wind up going to prison anyway. Yeah, you know, if you're gonna go to prison, uh, you'll do better with a public defender going to prison or yourself. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, as an attorney, I am not, I am not advocating that anyone should put themselves in a position to move through the system alone without an attorney. I'm not going to advocate that because I know that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. What I'm saying is that when you're in that situation, you have to make the right decision. Sometimes it may be better to go it alone, mm-hmm. but most of the time, 99.9% of the time, a person needs a lawyer and they need a competent lawyer when, they're, when their liberty is at, at jeopardy. Robert, what would you like to say? Robert's on the line. Good morning, Robert. Hey, Rob. Robert, you there? Good morning, Slay. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, good morning, Slay. This is uh, Robert Stacker out of Chicago. Good morning, Robert Stacker. Uh, uh, Attorney Wright is a good friend of mine. And uh, I just had to call in and give my love and support to my brother, man. Uh, I know him personally from another mutual friend. What a great time to honor him, uh 
than February. This is uh, Black History Month. Yeah. You know, and uh, I commend them and I want them to keep building and speaking up for those who don't have a voice. And uh, look forward to talking with him soon. He's right here. Say hi to him, Rob. <laughs> I'm on the phone, but I'll call you back. <laughs> oh yeah, Rob. Right <laughs> Rob, how 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 you doing, man? It's been it's been a little while. It's been a while, man. But I I, I see you, brother. I read about you. I, I'm online, and I and I keep all of the things you're doing, man. And I. But I, but to know you personally is an honor. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm, I'm. It's a pleasant surprise to 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 see you calling and you listening. I, I didn't even know that you knew that I was gonna gonna be on. But it's it's really a pleasant surprise. Thank you for calling in and and uh we we gotta we gotta meet up at some time. Howdy, sir. And uh, Sway, this is my first time calling, man. It, let me get my citizenship. Oh, you bro. ready? You ready? I got to give Isaac his, too. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you, Isaac, and Nicholas your citizenship all in the same breath, all right? Nicholas, Robert, and Isaac Wright Jr., you are officially citizens. I'm slaying them all day. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you official. You tried now, Isaac. I need some free legal advice anyway. Indeed. <laughs> uh, we don't, I know he has to go do other interviews, uh, but, man, come back anytime. What, are you on the west, east, west, midwest? Where you living? I'm on the east coast. East coast. You in Jersey? You working for the um, your counselor for the law firm? Yeah, right? Hunt, Hunt, Hamlin, and Ridley, full service law firm in, in Newark, New Jersey. I love to stay connected with you. Thank you, indeed. Okay, My absolutely, pleasure. man. And then Nicholas, you have to come back so we can talk more movies. Absolutely. Okay, Thank big you. fan of yours. Thank you. Huge fan of yours. Thank you. uh, one day we got to talk Top Boy too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. Count black.